Almost 2,000 years ago, a man lived in Egypt, a wealthy man named Anthony. Anthony's years are mid-200s to mid-300s AD. He apparently lived a few years past his 100th birthday, so very long life, long-lived guy. He lived in Egypt. He was a Christian. So those years, being a Christian in those years, uh, could be very, very challenging, could be deadly. You know, living in the Roman Empire, Egypt, of course, part of the Roman Empire, living in the Roman Empire back then as a Christian, you know, you're going to be living through some of the worst anti-Christian persecution to ever take place during the Roman period, in particular, the great persecution under Diocletian. And when Christians were tortured, killed, made to, you know, swear loyalty to the emperor as God, very, very dangerous time to be a Christian. And a time when the Christian community was torn apart in many ways. That's Anthony's experience. Well, one day Anthony is reading from the New Testament when he reads the story of the young ruler that approaches Jesus, the young ruler who's kept all the rules, he's kept all the, the commandments. And he comes to Jesus and he basically asks, what lack I yet? And Jesus congratulates him for his virtuous life he says, you only lack one thing, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Well, this young ruler goes away sorrowing. He won't do that. Anthony is very moved by this. And again, he comes from a wealthy family. So maybe he sees himself a little bit in that young ruler. And he decides he is going to follow this great commandment this final commandment of Jesus, he's going to be obedient. And so he, he sells all that he has, and he goes out into the East Desert of Egypt and becomes a hermit. He's going to achieve communion with the Lord, all on his own, out in retreat, as the Buddhists might say, in the East Desert. Well, it's not too long before he begins to attract followers, St. Anthony the Hermit. And they come out there and we see the beginning of a monastic community there in the East Desert. And this is generally considered to be the birth of the monastic tradition in the Christian tradition, the Christian version of the monastic tradition. St. Anthony, East Desert of Egypt. Well, while St. Anthony is still alive, some of his disciples travel west to the West Desert, to the edges of the West Desert, right where I am, right here. I'm on the edge of the West Desert in the Delta, and they create, they establish monastic communities of their own after his tradition. And amazingly, those monastic communities are still around, still functioning. This is a tradition that has been ongoing, really without a break, since the 300s AD, since the lifetime of St. Anthony. Now, several of the monasteries around here have closed, but there are four, at least four, in Wadi Nutrun, where I am, that are still functioning. Wadi Nutrun already had spiritual meaning, this area. This is a depression, this valley, where there are underground channels that link it to the Nile. And when the water goes down, it leaves deposits of salt and other chemicals. And the ancient Egyptians used to harvest that salt from this area, and they would use it as a crucial component of their mummification process. So this area already had those sort of spiritual roots dating back thousands of years before St. Anthony. Maybe this is on the minds of those who come out here to this very same valley and establish monasteries here. I don't know. But in any case, they establish them and you'll notice they're quite fortified. I mean, look at these walls here. In the beginning, they didn't even have gates or doors. They just had the walls. It was big closed off walls. Um, you were sort of sealed in. If you wanted to get in, you had to be sort of lifted in. And that's because the Western Desert is home to people for whom the monasteries were a temptation, a raiding temptation. And indeed, in the early 400s, and then again later in the 400s and in the 500s, th this would become, these, er these monasteries would become targets for raiders, Libyans, or as they call them on the signs around here, barbarians. And they would come in and raid, and these guys would retreat to their keeps. They had drawbridges, they had keeps uh, for their own safety. They were not always successful in saving themselves. Um, there's a well, 
a famous well in this monastery over here, the oldest well, where the story is that the raiders, after killing a bunch of the monks that lived there, washed their swords in the water of this well. And so this well is, is sort of remembered as the place where these, these monks' blood was washed off of these blades. In any case, this is part of the history. And, uh, you know, martyrdom is an important part. That's an important theme in Coptic Christianity. Any visitor to the Coptic churches and monasteries in Egypt will almost immediately see that that is true. Uh, the glorification of martyrs and martyrdom in general, major, major theme here. And given the often hostile environment, maybe it's not too hard to understand why. But it's not just the monastic tradition that's alive here. Um, you can come and be a monk, but you can also be a hermit, just like St. Anthony was a hermit. To be a hermit, supported by these communities, you do have to be a monk for 10 years. You come, you live with the monks for 10 years as a monk, uh, you join in the Eucharist weekly, you know, you're, you're part of the community for 10 years, you demonstrate your commitment, then you apply to be a hermit. And if your application is approved, you go pick a suitable cave out in the desert somewhere, and you begin to live in retreat. And the monasteries will actually resupply you. They'll send trucks out once a week. You know, formerly it was camels, but they'll send trucks out once a week to resupply you so you can stay in your cave. And once a month only, are you required to come meet with the community for services? I'm told that the monks have been eating at this table since the 800s. AD. In fact, the earliest monks would come here, and this is where they'd stock up on food, and then they'd carry it back to their caves. These days, like I said, it's, it's a truck that supplies them once a week, but the fathers here tell me that the, the hermits are decreasing in number because of development. It's harder and harder to find a suitable cave, to an actual retreat. And so all they can do now is develop the few caves that they already have, and they can't expand. So the world is changing very quickly. One of Anthony's disciples was named Macarius. Now, in the Coptic Church, St. Macarius. Now, Macarius was from the West Desert. He was from this area. He went over to the East Desert to study with Anthony, and then came back here and founded monastic communities of his own in Anthony's tradition. In fact, I'm standing at the site of the oldest monastic community in the West Desert. Of course, still active, still surviving. This is the Monastery of the Romans, and it's called the Monastery of the Romans because at some point, two strange youths or stranger youths showed up here to become monks to receive training here and it turned out that those two youths were the sons of a sitting roman emperor valentinian the first these guys came here and studied as monks under saint anthony's disciple unfortunately they died young but in their honor this monastery has ever since been known as the monastery of the romans So now I'm in the dining hall at St. Macarius Monastery, quite a few miles south of the Monastery of the Romans. You can see both of the monasteries had these stands where during mealtime, a monk would read from the Bible so that the monks eating at the table, you can see one right here. This whole room, by the way, dates back to the 10 hundreds, 11 hundreds. Uh, could concentrate on the Word of God while they were eating rather than on their food. This giant structure behind me is a keep, literally a medieval keep built in the 1100s by the monks here at St. Macarius Monastery in order to protect themselves from attack by Berbers, by desert people. Again, people they would call the barbarians. They would rush in there and actually there's a bridge on the other side here 
that they would pull up like a drawbridge, thereby sealing themselves in and cutting off all access to the building. So you can see how real these threats were to these people. There's the bridge right there. They would pull that thing up and there was no way in or out at that point unless they restored the bridge. And inside they had water, they had a well and they had gardens and provisions to last for up to a month under siege. So quite the fortified building for a monastery. And then over here, you can see examples of the cells that the monks live in. Of course, this is different than the caves where the hermits live. These are the cells where the monks live. And these cells date back to the 1700s, but they're pretty typical. You can see when you go inside, they have several different compartments, a place to lay down, bookshelf, little bookshelf, fireplace, whatnot. But very, very Spartan, as you would expect a monk's cell to be. So that original tradition of being a hermit, not just being a monk, but being a hermit, still alive and well out here in Wadi Natrun. The tradition of Saint Anthony lives on. 